Let's take our Bibles and let's head over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, I didn't mean it to be in any type of pious or, or boastful thing. I've not heard a message out of this text. And so in studying it, I wanted to share some things that we found out of it as we just for the next few weeks talk about some Christmas reflections. And I want to focus in on Matthew chapter 1. I was thinking about this since Matthew 1 is filled with names. How many of you have ever seen the memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, the wall? You all know then that many of you have seen it, that there it is, 144 granite-type panels side by side with some 58,318 names on it. Names that are put in order alphabetically as they go by the calendar each day that that whole war took place. And of those 48 or 58,000, if I said 48, it's 58,318 names, 17,000 of those names were married individuals. If you look through them, you'll find that 12 were just 17 years of age. Five were actually 16 years of age. As you go through the names and you know what they represent, 997 of those individuals listed there that they were killed on the very first day of action that they saw. And even more tragically, 1,448 were killed on their very last day of tour of duty. The way they did this memorial is they polished it in such a way, purposely so, that when you're looking at the memorial, you see your own reflection. And it was designed to just impress upon the individuals that this history also is blended in with us today. It impacts us today. That's the same thing that I think is happening in Matthew chapter 1. God there has a whole list of names. It's not that many. And some of them we don't know much detail about. But it's true. It's very, very clear that God is very interested in the names that are given there. He's interested in names at different times where he puts different names up on other genealogies. But this genealogy is the one that's focused in on Jesus Christ. Now, if you're like me, when you come to the genealogy, what do you normally do? You jump right over it. In fact, I'm not going to try reading these names, okay? I'm not going to attempt to be, appear more foolish than I am by trying to mispronounce them. And most of us, we kind of just gloss over it. And that's why I made the comment, I've never heard, you probably have, but I've never heard a study done out of the names and a, a message per se that's done on it other than a few excerpts of thoughts and yet we know that it's part of scriptures and all scriptures given by God by inspiration is profitable so I thought I would do something weird study these names and say what do they say what do they teach us what lessons can we glean out of just a list of all these different names and so as we go through it for a study this morning for whatever type of outline you're going to try to keep up with good luck okay as we go through the names let, let me just do it this way Let's just look at, so we understand better, how, what did they do in Bible days? What was their idea behind keeping all these names? What was their practice? Was it a common thing that happened? Actually, it was. It was very common that you would keep your family ancestral, ancestral records. We're, we're not big like this. That's not something that we're real keen on. I know that there's now a whole growing tide of trying to do your ancestral research, but that's just been recent. In Bible days, it was very common that you would know. In fact, when the Romans took over territories of the nobility and the people who were in the upper class, they had to know, and they had to have on record their history, their family tree back seven generations. I don't know seven generations in my own family. I only know a couple generations back by name. But in Bible days, they had to know that. In fact, in, um, in times going back, that they used this as not only as a common practice, but it would lend credibility to an individual. Um, if you were in the Roman society and you were of the nobility, you wouldn't let your daughter marry somebody who didn't know that they had five generations of good ancestry. If there was a mar, if there was some, some imperfection, if there was some character in those five generations, you wouldn't let her marry him. And so it was very common that we in their generation, in their time, that your ancestry had a big impact on where you were in society. That wasn't so long ago in American, in, in European history. The same thing was true. You've probably heard the story of John Lewis Macy, who was born in Britain. His father was a duke, a famous duke, but his mother and father, they weren't married. 
The Duke was married to somebody else. So he was a child born out of wedlock. As a result, his father never claimed him, never put him in his, um, in his family lineage to be an inherit, part of the inheritance, and so basically disowned him. As a result, Macy was disowned and rejected by much of European society, uh, English society. He wasn't uh, acknowledged, even though he started by his own successes to be a chemist, to be a mineralogist, and to explore and to do a lot of things, and was offered a couple teaching positions. They were rescinded at times, because when they found out his ancestry, that he didn't have a legal father, that all of a sudden impacted what jobs he could get. So he left Britain, amassed his own fortune, and when he died, he never married, never had any relative close to him, so he adopted the name of his father, his birth father, called himself Smithson himself, and then he donated all of his inheritance to the United States to develop an institution of learning that they could build a building and they could use to train other people in such things as geology and the earth's history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. His funds that he amassed was the first funds that were provided to start the Smithsonian Institute. But his family, his, his opportunities were limited because his credibility had a, had a factor in it. He didn't know or didn't, wasn't able to say, here's my legal ancestor. Now the Jews were even bigger on genealogies. The Jews at the time of Jesus Christ, they said that their genealogies lend credibility. Josephus is an author, a writer who writes in the intertestamental period. He, for instance, he lists out as he begins saying, I'm Josephus, I belong to, and he gives his family tree multiple generations. And that was very common that the Jewish writers would do that. But it was especially important for the priests. They had to be able to trace their genealogy all the way back to Aaron. And if they couldn't do that, then they weren't allowed to be a priest. That happened when Ezra came back. And they were trying to rebuild the temple and the worship service. Some priests couldn't prove their genealogy all the way back to Aaron, so they were kicked out. And so what the Jews did is they kept these genealogical records on file in the temple. Even by the time of Christ, that's where they were storing the genealogical records of your family if you lived at that time. And you, uh, if you wanted to be a wife of a priest, you had to know and be able to prove your genealogy several generations. What is interesting is all these records were destroyed in 70 AD. Nobody no Jew even today has their genealogical record all the way back to the time of the law except for one person. It's Jesus Christ in Matthew 1 and Luke 3. It's interesting that his were providentially spared through all of history. Why is that? Because these legal documents, these genealogical records, were very important when it came to Jesus Christ coming and claiming he was... Messiah. He was Emmanuel. He was God's spokesman. And so as you understand and look back in genealogical records in history, you know if you were studying any kind, if you were living in the Jewish society of the day of Jesus Christ, you knew that God was saying, I'm going to send my Messiah, my anointed one, Christ in the Greek, Messiah in the Hebrew, uh, as we transliterate him. And so he's saying, I'm going to send this individual who's going to come. And to identify him, God gave some very specific genealogical descriptions of him, as well as some of his works. According to Genesis chapter 3, this one who would be sent by God was going to be born of, of a woman. The virgin doesn't come in until later on when in the book of Isaiah. But in Genesis 3, born of a woman, very clearly with this sense that this could be a miracle birth. That's going to be reiterated in Isaiah chapter 7. In, Jude, in Genesis 22, he had to come from Abraham, be able to prove his lineage to Abraham. According to Genesis 49, he had to be able to prove he was in the lineage of Judah. 
Okay, one of the 12 tribes, not one of Esau's children or not one of the other tribal members. He had to come from the tribe of Judah. Then you get into 2 Samuel 7. It's very specific. He had to be born of David's lineage. And so God is narrowing it down. And then God said as well, he's going to be coming. He's going to do miracle signs. He's going to be able to do, do these things that you should be able to ask. Give us a sign, which they did. And so when you come to the New Testament era, when this is being written, when Matthew is being recorded, recorded, understand what is going on at that moment. Matthew is writing to the Jews. As he's writing to the Jews, he's writing to a group of people who have a Messiah fever, a Messiah frenzy going on. They are looking for Messiah, people who are in the know, that is. How do I know that? Well, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, there was prophecies given. Those prophecies were repeated in several of these chapters, and they said that there's going to be four major uh, um, nations or kingdoms that would come. The first kingdom is defined and described and declared in the book of Daniel that it was the, do you remember the first golden kingdom? It's Babylon. It's even stated in the book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar, you are the golden head. You are the first of the major kingdoms. Now you're a Jew living in society. Let's put you at uh, right around the time Jesus comes on the scene and starts declaring himself. So you're right around 25, 20, 25 to 30 AD. And you know your history if, you, if you've been trained at all. You know that the first great kingdom of the four was going to be, was said to be Babylon. And then you also know by studying history that of this next kingdom that was going to come, the next one that you go back into history, you're going to find out and you know that it was Medo-Persia. They came in and they overtook the Babylonians. They are mentioned in the book of Daniel on a couple occasions. And you know your history well enough that you know the third great kingdom that came that even your ancestors took the book of Daniel, went out and met Alexander the Great, who was leading the Greek empire that was expanding around the world. They took Daniel, they showed it to Alexander when he was coming to ransack Jerusalem, and they said, this passage is about you, Daniel. God spoke about you, and as a result, he didn't attack Jerusalem. He was so impressed by that prophecy. So you're a Jew living in 30 AD. You know the first kingdom has come and gone. You know the second kingdom has come and gone. You know the third kingdom has come and gone. And you also know the prophecy says that there's going to be a fourth kingdom. And during the fourth kingdom, Messiah will come. Well, who are you living under? That's a world empire right now. You're living under Rome. So what do you expect could happen at any moment? The Messiah could come. And the Messiah could overthrow the Roman Empire. And he was going to come. Remember the stone that comes from heaven and, and destroys the ten toes, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Well, they would picture that as being their day. And so they were looking for Messiah. In fact, one of their books, their, uh, their extra-biblical books, has this prayer. This, and it's, the heading is, A Prayer for the Davidic Prince to Come and Overthrow the Romans. So they were teaching this. That Messiah is coming any day. That helps you and I to understand, well, this makes sense. This is what Simeon was about. Simeon was looking for the Messiah because there's a Messiah fever taking place. There was also Anna who come and she spoke to all that were looking for the redemption in Jerusalem. There was other people looking for Messiah. It helps explain that when John the Baptist came and preached these words, repent, the kingdom of coming is at hand, prepare ye the way of the Lord, they understood this to mean Messiah could be here any moment. In fact, it says that how much of Jerusalem went out to hear John the Baptist? Jesus says all of Jerusalem went out there to listen to him. They were caught up with this idea, is there going to be a deliverer? Is he coming at this moment? What is so ironic is they have all this truth, they have all this expectation, but when Jesus says, I am he, what do they do with Jesus? They reject him. They reject him, even though they say, give us many signs. And by the way, the Sanhedrin had set up by this point, this is beyond what we read in the Bible, but from their documents, they set up a committee and a system that if somebody came along and declared themselves to be Messiah, which a number of people were doing, such as Judas of Galilee and others, 
that they were supposed to send out a group of priests to go and start vetting that person. It wasn't wrong for the priest to come from Jerusalem and say to Jesus, show us a sign. That was part of the vetting process. The, the tragedy is he showed them signs and they kept on saying, show us another sign, show us another sign. But what I want you to get at is in, in the midst of this idea, people were saying, is there a Messiah? Is there a Messiah? What would be so important as a Jew to prove whether Jesus was a Messiah or not? He had to fulfill the prophecies. He had to have the right genealogical record. He had to be able to prove that he comes from Abraham, Judah, David. And so what happens with Matthew chapter 1? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, what do you read? Read it with me. Read out out. Matthew 1, 1. The book of the genealogy or generation of Jesus Christ, the son of... The son of... Why did Matthew do that? Matthew's writing to Jews to prove that Jesus is the one. That Jesus is the exact one, and he's going to start off by saying, I'm going to give you evidence. I'm going to give you physical evidence that Jesus is the one, and he starts with this statement. And then he develops the genealogy, the record of Jesus Christ, and he lists out all those individuals. So what does this text teach us? What is all of this that if you were to sit and go, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas his, and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh, and Zerah of Thamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, and Aram begat, now big names that I'm not going to say. Okay. If you're reading that through, this is really important for you to get in the first century. Because it's going to say to you some really important truths. It's going to tell you in the first century that Jesus was a real human. Now you accept that, but put yourself back in the sandals of people now getting Matthew's letter. Let's fast forward. Jesus has lived, buried, been killed, buried, resurrected. We're getting this letter, let's say around 60 AD. Let's just throw that as a, as a possibility. And so you're receiving this you're hearing Jesus' genealogical record. But on top of that, this is a very important truth because some teachers are coming along and saying Jesus really, didn't, really you know, was just a mere man or others were saying that he never came as a people. He was, there was a whole teaching, Gnosticism, that was going on at that time that was saying Jesus did not come in the flesh, he came in the spirit. Because if he came in the flesh, he was tainted by sin, he was you know, like we are, struggling, etc., etc. They didn't acknowledge the virgin birth. And so they're writing and they're saying this, that Jesus was a real people. He was God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. He wasn't just a spirit. He had a human birth. He had a human family. This was critical. This was absolutely essential. And by the way, this makes Christianity unique. As one of the authors I was reading, he comments in his, in his commentary, he says that he was teaching somebody, and as he was teaching and working in India, he came across a fellow who was searching for truth. He tried Hinduism, he tried Buddhism. It was Christianity that caught his attention, because, and it was this passage, this very text, that persuaded him to really research Jesus Christ. Because he made this comment, he was no myth or legend, he was a real person rooted in history, not in fable and not in, in just some type of mythological teachings. Jesus was a people, a real people. And this becomes an essential doctrine later on. If you deny that Jesus Christ comes in the flesh, you are of Antichrist, according to 1 John. So this is an important doctrine, teaching to the churches and the early works of saying Jesus really was a people. He can prove who he was. He was a real man who lived 33 years on earth. He was a real person who never did sin, even though he had flesh. He, that made him different than any one of us, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but not Jesus. He was tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin. 
And so that makes him a unique individual, one who is able to take our place and our punishment because he didn't have to take any punishment for himself. So he could pay for our sins. And he was physically put on the cross, sacrificed as a sinless sacrifice for our sins. But the glory of it is he resurrected several days later and ascends into heaven where he sits at the Father's right hand and he is ruling and reigning there in heaven and planning to bring his rule and reign to earth. But right now, offering to each and every individual that they can have an opportunity to get born again through the real person of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life that no man can come unto the Father but by him. So that is an important thought that comes out of Matthew 1 for those who were in the very first century and for us today. For people who would deny that Jesus was a historical figure, there's his genealogical record. He was a real human being. Something else that stands out, though. As you go through the names, it's very clear he's not just a real human, he's the rightful heir. The rightful heir to sit on the throne. He was the Messiah. How do we know that? He emphasizes very specifically two of the heroic figures that Jesus descended from starts off saying he's a descendant from Abraham. You read that right away in the next verse. You see it in verse 1. You see it in verse 2 where he starts off and saying Abraham begat, Abraham begat. And so he's telling us this one came down through the line of Abraham which was one of the major credential points to find out is he Messiah or isn't he. And in Luke it's very interesting. Luke doesn't have this same order. Luke isn't written to Gentiles, but it's, or isn't written to the Jewish people, but it's written to Gentiles. He does a, reserve, a reverse type of genealogical record, and he includes Abraham as well. But he goes all the way back to Adam. And so there's a little bit of difference between these two genealogical records, but they're both making it very clear. Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. The other thing that is very clear and very emphatic amongst Matthew 1 is he was the descendant of David. David was the character that they talked about. Remember Messiah's nickname in the New Testament? The son of... David. It keeps on coming up, coming up. So if we were living back in that day, Abraham was very important, but David was almost because of we're closer in history and the writings and the temple there, which had been first, you know, helped to be established by David, all these things. David was the key character. And so he's writing, he's saying he's the son of David. He says that in the passage on a couple occasions, making it very clear that he begat, that he begat him. And in Matthew 1.17, go towards the end of it. He does something very unusual. He says in verse 117, after he gives all the names, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. From David until the carrying away of Babylon are 14. And from the carrying away of Babylon unto Jesus or the Christ are 14 generations. And he emphasizes this, which is a really strange verse in my mind. Not to be irreverent to the Lord. Why did he do that? Why did he say that? Here, here's the reason that I want you to think with me about why this is, this is so odd. He is saying in the Jewish history, there's three 14-generation segments that we're dividing this genealogy in. And yet, what's interesting is this genealogy does not include all of the generations. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here is a listing of Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. If you go to right about here where you have Zerubbabel mentioned, then you have Joseph. Okay, you've got the nine different names. But if you go to Luke and you say, okay, from there to Joseph, you have 18 different names. So Matthew, he purposely eliminates a number of the names. Does he all of a sudden, does, he, does that mean that his record isn't good? No, no, no. From a Jewish point of view, can you write your great-grandfather's name, begat your name? Can you do that in Jewish writing? Yes. So he's, he's not doing something that's incorrect. He's doing something purposeful. Why is he purposely leaving out a whole group of names to keep 14, 14, 14, and making that a point. That there's something here in the historical record that would emphasize 14, 14, 14. 
Well, there's some possibilities. The possibility could be I just, he just wanted balance. He wanted a, an outline that was parallel, that just kind of worked together. Maybe he was doing that so that as they memorized, they could memorize easier 14 names, 14 names, 14 names. Or maybe that he's doing it to picture Israel's history. The way he divided it down. He divides it and says, from Abraham to David, oh, that's the rise of Israel to the kingdom. From David up until the captivity, that's the fall of Israel where they just got worse and worse. And from the fall, the going back until Jesus comes, that's the re-rising of Israel. Maybe that's the point. Or maybe, just maybe, he's using a Hebrew form of emphasis. In the Hebrew writings, they would have a gematria. If I'm saying that correct, it might be gematria, I'm not sure. But they have this form of writing at times. Don't build doctrines off this, but just make an observation. Okay, this is what you do, is you take the letters that are in the alphabet, like A would be 1, B would be 2, C would be 3, D, and you go on. And you could take something, and you could find out the significance. You know how they do with Antichrist? That, you know, every president that you have been in history, Ronald Reagan, his, you add up the letters, and it was 666, he had to be Antichrist. You know, that type of thing. So was Barney the dinosaur. Okay, you could, do, you could do that with anything. Okay, but the Hebrews did do this at times. And if you take the name of David, and you take its, the, the letters, the Daleth and the Vav and the Daleth, and you put them in there, here's what you get. You say, okay, let's add them together. You've got the fourth letter, the sixth letter, and the fourth letter, which adds up to 14 which writers, Jewish writers, say that's what Matthew was doing. That Matthew was emphasizing David, 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 the son of David. I don't know. But I find that extremely interesting that Matthew is doing writing to the Jews, making some type of emphases. And that one seems to be very, very uh, reasonable that he was emphasizing Jesus is out of the lineage of David. And so you have Jesus being presented clearly as the rightful heir. You also have in this passage, he is being clearly presented as one of heavenly origin. That he wasn't just of earthly uh, man and woman. He had a heavenly origin. Now you know this. You know that every creature that's born, every person that's born is a new person. That through the, the act of, of birth, we didn't have a pre-existence before we were born. We were contrary to what Mormons and others teach. We're not baby, spiritual babies in heaven. You know, even Disney movies, we're not spiritual babies in heaven waiting to be dropped through a hole to come to some body here on earth. The Bible teaches that our existence begins when we're conceived. And so the idea that Jesus had a pre existence is clear in this text, in this genealogical record. So Matthew presents it clearly in verse 16. As you go down into it, and it says, Jacob begat Joseph. Okay, look at all the previous verses. The word begat, 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 begat shows up. Where, where is Joseph begat Jesus? Where is it? It's not there. Why is that? Because Joseph did not begat Jesus. The passage clearly says Joseph, uh, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, some will run with this text and they say, well, see, it doesn't qualify. It doesn't make it very clear. It could be Joseph, of whom was born Jesus, could refer to Joseph. That's if you don't know a grammar at all, you could say that. If you don't, don't understand how language works, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, the of whom is clearly a feminine pronoun. Feminine pronouns are not used with masculine names. They're used with the feminine name. So who's the of whom Jesus was born Jesus? Who is he clearly referring to? Mary, and only Mary. 
Joseph didn't begat, and of the of whom is saying Mary. He is saying to his audience, not only is he, not only is he from Abraham, not only is he from David, but he is also born of a woman, Genesis 3.15, without an earthly father. In other words, a miracle child. And in fact, Matthew wants you to catch it so much, what does he do? Matthew writes down in a few more verses where he says in verse 20, While Joseph thought on these things, the angel appeared to him and said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And he goes a little bit further and he says, he quotes Isaiah, verse 23, Behold a... Virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. He should be called Emmanuel. So Matthew wants in the very opening book for you and me to catch this. Jesus is of the right family history to be Messiah. Jesus is a heavenly being in an earthly body. Came as a real human, but his origin is heaven. And so he's defining the deity of Jesus Christ, trying to get people to understand that this person is totally unique, that he is God in the flesh. He even says that. Did you catch that? Verse 21, his, he's going to be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. And so the, the genealogy is making tremendous claims, is putting tremendous theology down, laying it out for the audience. But not only is there the idea that he is human, that he is of the rightful heir, but he is also a heavenly being, he is the hope. He is the hope of all people. It is really fascinating when you compare Jesus' genealogy to most of the Jewish genealogies. Jesus, his record, you know, and again, we can't compare what, what they used to be able to do because it's, they're destroyed, but we understand from history that in genealogy, genealogical records, they included men only. No offense, ladies, but you weren't there. Okay? They just didn't put the ladies' names down because they're talking about the legal you know, inheritance here. And yet in Jesus' genealogy, how many ladies are listed? There's four. There's four, without Mary. There's four of them listed. That those four who are there are listed in verse 3, 4, 5, and 6. Verse 3, who's the first one mentioned? Tamar. Tamar. Okay, the spelling's a little bit different. Because you're, in a different, you're tra going from one language to another. The Matthew written in Greek, Tamar would be Hebrew. Okay, what, verse 4, who's the lady mentioned? Okay, you've got a couple different ladies that are going to be mentioned here. You've got Rahab mentioned, and then you have Ruth mentioned, and then who do you have mentioned in verse 6? In fact, you don't have her name mentioned. That's why you're struggling. Her name isn't even given. What does it say about her? The, the wife of Uriah. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop, time out. Who's the wife of Uriah? Bathsheba, who does she end up marrying later on? But when she first got pregnant with David, she was the wife of Uriah. Think of what Matthew is doing, okay? Let's just think about these four ladies, okay? They're all Gentiles. They're all Gentiles. That's pretty interesting that you're presenting a mixed blood in, uh, genealogy at a time when Jesus is coming to this earth. You're presenting it. And how do the Jews feel about mixed blood people? The Samaritans are mixed, Jew, mixed blood Jews. How do they get along? And so in this genealogy, he's presenting the truth. He's saying Jesus comes from mixed blood. Part Jew, part Gentile. That would stir up those, you know, those Jewish leaders. That would upset them. But then they have questionable backgrounds. Each one of them has a questionable background. Tamar, do you remember her story? Tamar is the daughter-in-law to Judah. Her husband, Judah's son, dies. She says, according to Leviticus, you're supposed to give me another one of your boys who's supposed to marry me and raise up a son, because I have no child, raise up a son to my ex-husband, my, my um, deceased husband, thank you, to the deceased husband. Judah doesn't do it. Judah doesn't do it. So do you remember what Tamar does? 
we're in a mixed audience, but this is a Bible story. She goes to the, the marketplace and she dresses like a harlot, a prostitute. And she seduces Judah, gets pregnant by him, and bears a son. Wow. That's the way to put things down in the family history. You got Tamar's name listed. And then you have Rahab, who is for, throughout the Bible, even in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, what is she called? What's her title? Rahab the harlot. Okay, this gets a little bit tougher. We're putting these people in the genealogical records in a time and in a society where if you have blemishes in your record, they blemish you. And then you have the one, Ruth, Okay, and Ruth is a godly gal, but still you got the blemish that she's a Moabite. And they weren't supposed to be marrying the Moabites. And then you have the one who is the biggest blemish, the wife of Uriah. Don't even say her name. But you put down the wife of Uriah, which is all... all what is he stressing here? What is he telling us in this genealogy? Why would, why would he do this? You're threatening the acceptance of Jesus as being this, this Messiah because some people are going to look and go, Ugh! he's got Gentile blood. Ugh! He's got ladies in his background that are, Ugh! okay? And, and it's the society as a whole, you know, they, they would view this. There are times when people sanitize their backgrounds. Yes, no? Okay, I'll give you one. This is more recent in history. Okay, Judy Wallman, who does genealogical records, she found out that she and Senator Harry Reid have a common relative. Not too far back in the 1880s. This common relative that they find out, his name is Remus Reid. And she did a little bit of record, and she even found this photograph, and on the back side of the photograph, it gives his history. It says that in the 1880s, he was a cowboy, he started robbing railroad, railroads for money. And this was happening in Montana. He got arrested and tracked down by the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And they, uh, they found him guilty, put him in prison. And his hanging was in 1886. And when they hung him, it was the town event. Everybody in town came to see it. Okay. So Harry Reid, she sent this to him just to say, hey, this is our common ancestor, y'all. This is somebody in your family tree. And Harry Reid's office wanted to sanitize this when the press got a hold of it because they didn't want this to blemish his character. According to our research, Remus Reed was a famous cowboy in Montana and had extensive business dealings with the Montana Railroad. In 1887, he was a key player in the investigation by the Pinkerton Detective Agency. In 1889, he passed away during an important civic function held in his honor when the platform upon which he was standing suddenly collapsed. Now that is a way, that is a way to sanitize your history, okay? To just twist it in such a way. Why doesn't Matthew sanitize Jesus' history so that people don't go get, you know, get off with it and get put out by it? Because God has a purpose. God is reflecting to us an honest history, which God is honest. He is telling us that there was scandalous pregnancies. Isn't that interesting? He includes scandalous pregnancies and what is happening to Mary. She is being viewed as a scandalous, a scandalous pregnancy. Okay? And as well, the Gentiles are there. What is, what is the message being given to the Jews? Gentiles are welcome to, with this guy. He's got Gentile blood. He's got a relationship with how many people? All people. That's where Luke jumps and takes us to him all the way back to Adam. As well, he's saying to us that God doesn't run away from sinners. God isn't ashamed of sinners, nor would he avoid him. This is an expression to the Jews reading this that Jesus isn't ashamed of his history. He is open and welcoming sinners of all different backgrounds to come to him. 
that they are important to him. He understands them. They're in his family lineage. Gentiles, they were part of God's program all along. God wasn't just this pure blood with the Jews only. God had dealings with the Gentiles, even to the point of bringing Jesus to this earth. That God has opened, and by the way, you and I better be very thankful for that last thought. Because we're Gentiles. If there was no offering, outreaching towards us, where would we be? Okay? So this idea of Jesus giving hope to all people is fascinating, is amazing. So he's the right guy, he's a human being, he's this hope of the entire world, he's the high point of all history. He's the high point of all history. You've got, like most genealogies, you've got things that you and I would like to find. All, we would be excited. Let's do a genealogical record, and you found out that so-and-so was in your history. Who would, who would be somebody you would say, great, I'd like to have him in my history? Who? Abraham Lincoln. George Washington. Ben Franklin. Okay. You're listing positive people. None of you said, I would like to have Adolf Hitler in my family tree. Okay. We don't like that, okay? You know, which is fine. So ge they're giving a genealogy. They're including some of the eh, people okay, that would be viewed that way. But he also says, hey, listen, I'm giving you the greatest heroes of Jewish history. Here they are. They're part of Jesus' tree. This is phenomenal. But it is interesting that Matthew does it this way, but Luke does just the reverse. He takes it all the way from Jesus going backwards, where Matthew 1 is starting to say, I'm going to give you this one from Abraham going forward. Abraham was a great guy. Judah, great guy except for with his daughter-in-law. David, great, great guy. You know, and here we keep on going through all these great guys. Solomon, a pretty good guy. Hezekiah, a pretty good guy. But the greatest of all these guys is... Jesus Christ. It all leads up to Jesus Christ. It's all pointing that he is the greatest. He is the high point of all history. Why is that? Because he came to save his people from his sins, from their sins. That he is this phenomenal character. He alone is the Savior. He alone is Emmanuel. That's what this whole, this whole section's about, is drawing our attention to say it's all about Jesus, King Louis. The Sun King reigned longer than most any other ruler in history, 72 years in France, during the golden years of France. At his funeral service, they had his body there uh, in, the, in the chapel, and they had one light that was above it, one candle that was really brilliant. All the others were to keep dim. The idea was he was such the light of the entire nation. Well, when they came to the funeral service, the bishop who was doing it walked in, and the first thing he did was he extinguished the light, and he said... God is the greatest, not Louis. He was right. He was right, but we often get caught up with people. There is a story that's, uh, that's a true story that Adam and I, our William Carey, who was the father of modern nations, he is writing to a dear friend of his, and he says, please, please pray for my son. My son had dedicated his life to missions, but now he has stooped to become an ambassador for the Queen of England. Why is that? Because Kerry had it right. He says the greatest thing you can do, the greatest thing is to make sure you exemplify Christ and you exalt Christ. You know, you go down to New York City, what used to be called the RCA building. When they first built it, they put this huge atlas out there holding up the world. And how is atlas usually pictured? Strong. What's he doing? He's straining to hold up the world, to keep it in place. Go right across the street. St. Patrick's Cathedral, and what do you find in there? You find this statue of a little Christ child without effort holding the world. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? It's Jesus Christ. You ever hear of John Newton? What song did he write? Okay, so when he's older and he's, he's preaching in his latter, latter days of his preaching, he's standing at the pulpit and they would have somebody speak for him because his voice wasn't able to project. And he was at the pulpit and all of a sudden he stops at this one point and he just keeps, he, Christ is precious. Christ is precious. The young man who was saying, leaned over and quietly whispered, he said, you've said that already, thinking he had gotten senile. 
He said, you said that already, sir. Do you want to move on? With that, Newton full, you know, drew up to his full posture. And he says, I meant to say it. Over and over and over again, Christ is precious. Christ is precious. You see, we, we forget this at times. We get caught up with so many things, we forget how great Christ is. This Christmas season isn't about the gifts, and I'm glad we're going to share them. It isn't about the decorations, and they are beautiful, and I'm glad they're done. It isn't about you know, our vacations, and I'm glad that we can celebrate them. It's about Jesus Christ. He is the most important part of Christmas. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, we're going to sing this song in prayer to the Lord, in testimony to the Lord. I invite you to go over here and talk to any of our staff over here. Talk with them while we sing. They'll take you to private. They'll show you from the Word of God how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, how you get born again. You do that while we sing about our Jesus this morning. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out the comb. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather be His and let Him lead than to be the King of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Father, help us to have this attitude, not just right now. Help us to have it come later on today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, when we're busy with stuff. Help us to make sure we magnify you. We exalt you. Help us make sure that this Christmas season we share our faith in you with others. Help us to magnify the Maker more and more and more. Together we want to thank you for giving us hope, for giving us salvation, for being that human that came to this earth from heaven so that we could have eternal life. Until you take us home, help us to love you, to exalt you, to make you the high point of our life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Tonight we'll pick up, talk more about what this prophecy, this genealogy teaches. Thanks for being here.